Welcome back to the Ladakh Literature Festival of 2020. Our session for today is Geology in the Himalayas, a discussion between Pranay Lal, Nigel Hughes, Neptune Srimal, and Rajiv Patnayak. Three professors of geology and paleontology, Nigel Hughes, Neptune Srimal, and Rajiv Patnayak, will be in conversation with author Pranay Lal and take the listener on a journey of Ladakh's geological history. Together, they will tell stories about its deep ecological past through rock and fossil records and anecdotes of discoveries they have made over the past three decades. Good afternoon, good evening to whoever is tuning in from whichever part of the world. Uh, my name is Pranay Lal uh, and I attempt to write on natural history. I'm quite sure that I'm not the only one who, as an outsider, came to this beautiful country blessed with very high mountains and plateau called Ladakh. And the first time I reached here, my mind was blown by the extraordinary things that I saw here. Uh, we live in a very difficult time and increasingly as we get connected, uh, we are increasingly getting cut off from the natural world. Never in the history of our lives or even the lives of our parents or our grandparents, did we know more about the natural world than we know now. But yet, at this particular moment, we face the greatest crises of climate change, pandemics, and extinctions. And that are taking place right before our eyes. And it's going to happen also in, in, the, in the face of our subsequent generations. But when you come to a place like Ladakh, Ladakh just leaves you uh, with such awe and a sense of wonder. And I'm sure it has stayed with you uh, as well as as it has with me. And my three guests today are people who have traveled the length and breadth of this wonderful, beautiful piece of earth that we call Ladakh. I have the tall order to ask my three distinguished guests to cover about 450 million years or so in from the earliest time when the, the, the region of Ladakh was being assembled in less than about 45 minutes. So I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Nigel Hughes. Uh, Nigel teaches uh, geology at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, he has worked in the Himalayas uh, for more than four decades, and he has written perhaps the most comprehensive monograph on the Cambrian uh, aged fossils of Ladakh and Spiti. Uh, Nigel also um, has done extensive outreach programs uh, through stories and storytelling for children about the geology uh, of the subcontinent. So he continues to educate uh, even beyond his classroom. So welcome to the uh, talk, uh, Professor Hughes. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Neptune Srimal. Uh, he is a professor of geology in the uh, Florida International University in Miami. Uh, Neptune da has uh, over three decades um, uh, he has been, uh, he has surveyed uh, the Himalayan region in Ladakh, Uttarakhand, uh, Arunachal Pradesh, uh, when he was with uh, the Geological Survey of India, and he has done so subsequently after his retirement. I think he's among the people who has covered uh, every corner, if I may say so, and possibly in upturned every rock that you can see in Shok, Nubra, and Karakoram uh, since the 1970s, and has mapped the entire Indus River. Uh, our third speaker is Professor Rajiv Patnaik. Uh, he is Professor of Geology at the Punjab University in Chandigarh. He has won several awards for his uh, immense work on uh, the fossil records of the Shivaliks and the Himalayas and many other parts of the country. His most recent accomplishment is that, that he has co-edited a volume on the post-Gondwana breakup, which is a tribute to uh, the great paleontologist uh, Professor Ashok Sani. So our guests are going to speak in the order that I have introduced them. Uh, Nigel Da, uh, let me ask you first, um, how would you explain to a novice like me when I visit uh, uh, Ladakh, that how do you explain the beautiful colors, the sequences, the strata as geologists call it? How do you explain what you see um, uh, when you land at say the Leh airport? So. Give us a sense of what about the time and what we the first thing I just want to say is, um, you know, as a as a Bideshi, um, <laughs> you know, what a what a privilege it is to work on the geology of, uh, of India. Um, I have for you know 30 years or so had the, the opportunity to do that. 
Um, there is no part of the world that is more spectacular, uh, that the geological history is more exciting, um, and that the potential for educating uh, the public about this special history of the subcontinent that's shared by everyone is uh, is just immense. So um, uh, it's been my great pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to come and work in the subcontinent, and I'm I'm so grateful um, for that. So um, your question, you know, uh, was was pertaining to the fact that when you get off the plane in in Ley or come up on the bus. Uh, you you know you can't help but be impressed by the the striking layers that you see. I mean that is the thing that you see in the exposed layers of rock, and they may be tilted at various different angles, um, and they're there. They're exposed because of course it's high and beyond the rain shadows, so um, the there is not vegetation covering all these rocks, and we can see the motif of our planet, which is that. Um, written in the rocks is a series of events laid down in each layer. And it's very appropriate that this is a literary festival uh, because we're talking about books, of course, and the earth is a book. The earth has written its own story. And just like learning a language, what geologists do is learn the language of the rocks. And it's our privilege to, uh, to try and, and uh, understand that. Um, so what I'm going to do to start off with is, we, we, you know, with the geology of Ladakh is the most spectacular in the entire world. Um, it's not possible for us to give more than just a hint um, of the geology. But I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, some of the earliest history, geological history in Ladakh. And then we're going to go through in time to younger and younger and tell the spectacular story of India's uh, of India's migration as a subcontinent um, and the formation of the, the of the Himalaya. So I just need to share my screen here uh, and uh, find my presentation. There we go, um, and start that off. Um, and so here is, of course, the the subcontinent, um, and we see, um, you know, the the uh, the range of the Himalayan mountains. And of course, these are the, the highest mountains in, in the world. Um, and uh, Lad uh, Ladakh is uh, in this position. Um, and we've been talking about the fact that there are layers of rock. Well, each one of those layers represents um, a portion of the history of the earth. Um, and it's laid down in uh, primarily in layers of sedimentary rock, just like today, the high parts of India, the Himalaya, are being eroded away and material is passing in the great rivers, the uh, Ganga and um, the Indus, down into the Indus Fan or into the Bay of Bengal and laying down layers. And that's happening today and it's happened throughout uh, the Earth's geological history. Our planet is spectacularly placed. It's the right size to have lots of activity at the Earth's surface, moving the plates of the Earth around. And it's also um, the right distance from the sun to have uh, liquid water and an atmosphere um, and the opportunity to move things around at the surface. So that's why our planet's so incredibly dynamic. And here's a, a shot um, of the geological structure of Ladakh. And I don't want to spend much time on this, but just to say, that um, here is Ley, and you can see a lot of colors in a small space. This is what geologists produce when they're showing where the different kinds of rock are occurring. And there's a lot of different kinds of rock in a small space. I'm gonna talk really about Zanskar, um, and a particular area in which we've worked extensively. Um, you can see that it's shown in green here, and next to it is what's called the High Himalaya. Now, in the Zanskar range, the rocks that I'm talking about are preserved nicely in layers, but in other parts of the Himalaya, um, those same layers have been squashed and deformed inside the Earth's crust, and they've turned into um, what's called a metamorphic rock, a rock that's, uh, that's changed substantially. So the, the episode I'm going to talk about is about 450 million years ago. 
Um, the Earth is 460 crore uh, years uh, 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 old, million uh, uh, years old. So uh, 4.6 billion years old. Um, so this is just a, a, a relatively recent history. But the next slide I'm going to show you is what the Earth looked like at uh, that time. And it's going to look very different. It's a map of the entire world. And you'll see that um, we, uh, we have some uh, a, a geography that's really very different um, from the world as it, uh, as it is today. Uh, I'm speaking to you from California, uh, which would have been somewhere off uh, here. This is North America. Um, uh, some American politicians would really like this time because uh, North America is more isolated from the rest of the world than any other uh, than any other continent. Um, but India was not uh, separated at that time. Um, India was located in this position over here. Here's uh, here's the uh, position of of uh, Ladakh. Um, but you might just be able to see the V-shaped peninsula of India here. Um, and on India's west coast is Africa, uh, whoops, sorry. And on the east coast is Antarctica. And the green represents land and the light blue represents shallow ocean. And the amazing thing then is the world's highest mountains today and Ladakh up at high elevation was at that time the area where the shallow ocean was, was occurring. And as I said, the rocks tell the story of the earth. So the rocks that formed 450 million years ago in layers are the rocks that are now exposed in Ladakh and have their story to tell us. So um, uh, it's very interesting that, uh, that uh, of course, we're talking about the rocks in the highest mountains of the earth. So let's just look for a moment at Sagamatha or Chumalama or um, Everest. Um, this is the, the north side of Everest. There's the very summit. And the very summit of Everest is these rocks that are 450 million years uh, uh, old. And they contain fossils within them. And I'll show you the kinds of fossils they contain. You might see that um, this, what's called the Summit Pyramid, is sitting on top of about uh, 250 meters of yellow rock there. That's called the yellow band on Everest. It's made of ancient limestones, ancient reef that was occurring on the seafloor at this, uh, this time. And beneath that is many thousands of meters of gray and black rock, sandstones and shales. Um, now, this particular slide um, is a slide that talks about the 1924 expedition, the third expedition to Everest. And I mention it because the first geologist ever to work on Everest was called Noel O'Dell. And he was collecting what he thought were fossils, but what turned out later not to be because the rocks are too squashed. He was working at exactly this point here when George Mallory and Andrew Irving were ascending and climbing up these uh, steps in the yellow band um, in their attempt. And of course, very sadly, um, uh, they, uh, on the return, perhaps, they, uh, um, they slipped at this point and Mallory's body was found there a few years ago. But we're going to look at exactly these rocks now. These rocks that here in the uh, Everest region are deformed are not deformed in Zanskar. And this is why, one of the reasons why for my work, the Zanskar region is the absolutely perfect place. Remember that I showed you about 200 meters of yellowy looking rock or red looking rock. This is actually the, the equivalent. It's the same layer of rock, many hundreds of kilometers along the Himalayan margin. It's a little bit red here because it's got a little more iron staining in it, but it's the same unit of rock that is occurring in the yellow band in Everest. And just below that, here you can see, this is Pukdal Gompa, of course. Uh, everybody who's been to Zanskar will know Pukdal Gompa. Here's the, here's the track uh, up to Pukdal Gompa. 
Um, and uh, Puktal is actually, this is the, the, the same yellow band, the Kasha formation, as it's called. Um, and here we see these black uh, layers, just as we saw on Everest. But the great thing about these rocks is they're not so squashed in Zanskar, and they contain fossils in them. Here's uh, myself and a student um, uh, collecting in, in Zanskar some, some years ago. I'm, I'm not smoking a cigarette there or anything else. It's a, it's a pencil. Um, but uh, when you hit on these rocks with a hammer, like I'm doing there, um, you can find um, the fossils within them. And um, these, these fossils, uh, this is uh, the particular type of fossil that's called a, a trilobite. Um, this is just the head region or the central portion of the head. This is the stomach uh, capsule and the eye, one eye on that side, the other eye is broken off. Um, and one of the things that's wonderful about the Himalaya is that um, although uh, over the last 150 years, geologists have been there, not very many people have been, and there's immense amount of work still to be done. So there are new finds that are very easy to make, and we had the honor to name this after one of our dear uh, friends, uh, Shamali Kastigi, um, who uh, artist and activist who, uh, who very sadly um, died in, uh, in uh, 2012, and a, a friend of Neptune and, and myself. Um, uh, but if I just point out again, this is the stomach capsule, and here are the, uh, here are the eyes. Now, this is an animal that had its shell on the outside. So when the animal dies, often the pieces fall apart. So you just get the central part of the head. But in the next slide, you're gonna see a complete specimens. So these are ones where all the pieces are still joined together. So in this one here, that's the stomach capsule. And here are the eyes. And you can see all the segments behind and the fantastic variety of forms. Here's a beautiful one with a, a trident uh, at the front, of course. Um, uh, makes us think of uh, Hindu mythology, of course. Um, uh, but these spectacular animals, look at this one with its eyes on stalks. It would have been below the sediment, peeping out, uh, looking for, uh, uh, for uh, food or protecting itself. Um, absolutely dramatic animals living on the seafloor, in the ancient ocean that I showed you in that picture of what the world looked like 450 million years ago. So animals like this that were living in the ocean, the bottom of the ocean, are now preserved on the top of the highest uh, mountains on earth. Now, these are the trilobites. This is the group that I particularly work on, but they was a, there was a whole assemblage of animals that lived in those oceans. And this is a reconstruction of that. There's a trilobite in the middle here, and you can see that it's being attacked by what's called an orthocone nautiloid, uh, a relative of the clams and the, um, uh, and the, 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 uh, the snails and uh, the great molluscan group. But there are many other uh, animals that are, were living in that ancient ocean now at the top of Sagamatha, uh, for example, corals, um, uh, what are called sea lilies, but were actually an animal related to sea urchins and starfish, um, things that look like a clam but are not, that are called brachiopods, a whole uh, vibrant uh, tropical at that time ecosystem of animals now preserved in layers of rock that occur on the top of um, the world's highest mountain. And so the, the project that we are, um, we're concerned with um, at the moment, because I love to do this research and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to do this, but we want to share this history because um, geology is, is a stories that we can tell that you don't need actually a huge amount of specialist information to understand the broad story. And the broad story that we're going to tell you, and Neptune Dar will start t telling you in a minute, is so dramatic that every citizen of the subcontinent should know about this and be proud of it. It is something that is common to the heritage of everybody in the, the subcontinent. And, um, and that's why um, it's something that should be shared and, and widely known 
and something that really unites um, the, the, the subcontinent as a whole. So um, in order to, to, to do this, we talked a little bit about the book that we did some years ago. Um, but we want to now tell an animated series in Hindi um, and Urdu, in Bengali and in English, um, called uh, The Ocean on Top of Our Mountain. And we've just been talking about why there's an ocean. It's the ancient ocean that's on top of the mountain. And I'm being helped in this by a very, very capable and wonderful um, uh, illustrator called Trisha Banerjee um, and my, our friend Shekhar Mukherjee, um, director of the National Institute of Design um, in, uh, in Vijaywara in uh, Andhra Pradesh. And we're, I'm just about to have a meeting tomorrow um, to try and get some uh, funding from an um, uh, American organization for this. Um, uh, but this is just that history at 450 million years ago. Um, but what's so wonderful about the um, uh, about the the whoops sorry uh, about uh, India's history is that India has the most dramatic history of any part of the Earth's crust um, over the the subsequent 450 million years. Um, as you saw in the map. Uh, I showed you that India was originally next to Africa uh, on one side, on its west side, and on its east side, Antarctica and Australia. 300 million years or so later than that, India uh, and um, the, the, the other continents began to break apart because of hot jets of molten material coming from deep within the earth started to split and crack away India from Africa and then later from Antarctica and Australia. Hot spots, uh, as they're called. And India then started its amazing and magnificent voyage, 9,000 kilometers northwards, moving sometimes as much as 20 centimeters a year. Imagine the energy needed to move the continent of India 20 centimeters a year. Um, and as that happened, um, the sea in front of India uh, began to, the sea floor, composed of this dark basaltic rock, sank down underneath Asia. Uh, and slowly, Indi the Indian subcontinent began to uh, move northwards and ultimately, about 50 million years ago, uh, collided. And that is what uh, gave rise to the Himalaya. But this little diagram here is a little bit of a simplification. And I think that Neptune Da, who's worked for um, years in this area, is going to tell you a little bit more about uh, India's passage northwards um, and uh, the even more amazing story um, of the closure of the oceans um, that were in that area. So that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. So that's, Thanks, Pranay. That's just the right time to have uh, Prof. Professor uh, Srimal to tell us about what happened uh, between uh, the 60 million years, the journey between uh, India, Greater India coming to collide with Eurasia. I think that's going to be uh, the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes is what we are going to discuss or hear from Prof. Srimal. Over to you. The ocean floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm God of the oceans too, right? Neptune. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so this is the story that Nigel just told us. This is a picture of what the world was like about 300 million years back. And you can see all the southern continents were combined together in one super continent. Uh, you can see India over here and Africa, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. We call this continent as the Gondwana land. Gonds are the tribes in the central part of India. Actually, there's a station called Gondia Junction between Calcutta and Bombay. If you ever travel by Bombay Mail, you'll see that. Okay, so Nigel told you how India broke away from the rest of the Gondwana land and started moving northwards at a very rapid rate, up to 20 centimeters per year, which is 200 kilometers a million year. And remember, the smallest unit in for us geologists is like a million year. So that's like 200 kilometers every million year. 
So imagine how fast it must have been moving. But my story goes back farther, farther than this breakup. And we'll see that this was not the only breakup, but several other continental fragments broke away from north of the India or north of the Gondwana land. And those continental fragments, the story of those continental fragments, how they crossed oceans and collided with each other, that is the story of Ladakh. And that's the story I'm going to tell you. So here, these three globes in very short and very simplified way, in a generalized way, tells you the story of the formation of Ladakh and Tibet. So this was the Gondwana land. You can say it's Gondwana. That's, that's where the Antarctica was. At first from the, and between Gondwana land and this Northern continents, which is now Asia, we had a big ocean. Now we call that the Paleo Tethys or the Paleo Tethian ocean. Tethys was mother of earth, by the way. So at first a sliver of continent like that broke away from the Northern margin of Gondwana land. And they started moving northwards. When continents move northwards, the ocean floor along with it also moves northwards. And as uh, as Nigel just showed, I mean, the ocean floor, basically, if there's a continent, ocean floor dives under a continent. And gradually, the whole ocean disappears under the continent. This is a process we call subduction. And when continents break apart, an ocean opens up between them. So what was happening when this northern continent, when, when this sliver of continent, these slivers we call terrains or geological terrains or tectonic terrains. And this terrain is the Changthang terrain. You all know the Changthang, you know, north of Karakoram uh, range or north of uh, Pongong Lake. That's the Changthang region. Although I have uh, spelled it Kyangthang, that's the way the Chinese and Tibetans nowadays spell it. So as this continent is going north, the Paleo Tethys was gradually disappearing under Asia and a new ocean was opening up between what was Gondwana land and, and these Changthang terrain. And we call that as the Mesotethis. Then another sliver, the orange part that you see over here, that's the Lhasa and Shiok Valley of present day. That also broke away from north of India, started crossing the ocean, as you can see over here. By this time, the Changthang terrain, this is about 22 crore years before now, 225 million years before now, we call the Triassic period. Of, that's when the dinosaurs used to roam the world, including parts of India. So the Changthang collided with Asia and the Lhasa and Shiok terrain that broke away from north of India and started moving north. And as I told, as they start moving north, the Mesotethis ocean that had opened up here gradually was disappearing underneath the Changthang. Now Changthang was part of Asia. Whenever the terrains uh, whenever the ocean floor dives under the continents, you see a chain of volcanoes there. So we had a chain of volcanoes here. And as it was going down under, the volcano was very active. But eventually, this whole Mesotethis ocean disappeared. And then by this time, India has broken away from Gondwana land about 130 million years ago, 13 crore years ago, and started moving northward. So what happened when India broke up? Basically, the Gondwana land started breaking up. Australia broke up, India over here, Africa over here, South America over here, Antarctica stayed where it was. So we had Indian Ocean and Atlantic Ocean, all those ocean form, and India started moving very rapidly northward and basically smashed again the Lhasa Shiok terrain that formed the southern part of Asia. And because of this huge collision by India, you can see all these terrains wrapped around India. So if you go to Burma and Thailand and Southeast Asia, the rocks that you see there are exactly the same rocks that we had in Tibet. Basically, it's the Tibet and Shiok rocks that wrapped around and went up, went down there. The same picture I'm showing you in this map, geological map of Tibet and Ladakh. You can see the yellow are the Changthang terrain that broke away first. Uh, then the pink one is the Lhasa Shiok terrain. This is Shiok over here in the Lhasa that collided with Changthang terrain and the whole ocean disappeared there. But when the ocean disappeared, when two continents collide, remnant of the ocean basin is squeezed between the two. So you see a small sliver of oceanic rocks. We call them ophiolites. And I'll tell you in a second why we call that. Ophis means snake. But what has this to do with snakes? But presence of those rocks tells us that there was an ocean there. The same thing over here, this blue thing are the rocks that 
Nigel just showed uh, showed us just now from the Zanskar, and the rest are all Himalayas and Indian Indian continent. So they smashed against the Lhasa terrain, which from the southern part of Asia, and another ocean totally disappeared here. So what you see here, we have a story of ter Changthang terrain. That's number one. The Lhasa Siok terrain. That's number two. And the Indian plate. That's number three. We'll talk about three continents and three oceans: the Neotethys Ocean, the Mesotethys Ocean, and the Paleotethys Ocean. The remnants of what? Which we now see in the rocks of Ladakh. So this is the same story uh, in more easily understood uh, form. Maybe this was the Greater India, the Gondwana land. The dark green is the Changthang. The light green is Lhasa Siok block, and the yellow is India. So you can see that. Uh, Changthang broke away here. You can see it broke away from the rest of the Gondwana land, started moving northward. You have subduction going on. The Paleotethys Ocean is going under Asia, the Euro is Asia. Eventually, the whole Paleotethys subducts, disappears, and Changthang, uh, Changthang here collides with Asia, as you can see over here. So the Asia has grown. After that, after the Changthang has collided, this ocean, the Mesotethys, has now grown quite a lot. As the Changtak is moving away, the ocean is growing. Eventually, that ocean also starts subducting, start, start going down under Changtang. The Shiok block starts moving northward. And about 225, about 140 million years ago, Shiok block collided with Changtang. So now the southern margin of Asia was there. And once that collided, the subduction started south of Shiok along the present Indus Valley, what we see now as the present Indus Valley. That's where India started, the, the Neotethys Ocean started going under Shio, and eventually India collided with the Shio. The India was a huge continent. The force of collision was so huge that it deformed rocks in Changthang, it deformed rocks in Shio, and it deformed rocks over here. That's how the Himalayan mountain range uh, rose there. And after the collision, the force of India's northward migration pushed the Indian margin underneath the Tibet. So all the way under the Tibet, the Indian continent is pushing and still pushing under Tibet. So you have a double thickness of continents below the Tibet and the continental rocks are lighter than the rocks that are deeper inside the earth. So they tend to float up, they rise up. And that's why whole uh, Tibet, whole Tibet is such high ground, it's flat but high ground. And that's why because of the crunching and collision and piling of rocks, that's why we see the Himalayas. And these are the story that you see in the rocks of Ladakh nowadays. So this is the map of Ladakh. You see this red line here is the roughly the Indus River. Uh, the lay is right over here where my arrow is there. This is the Nubra River and that's the Shiok River. And this is the upper Shiok River and you have Karakoram Pass and Daulat Beg Oldi over there. The Great Karakoram Mountain range is over here. The Ladakh range is over here. The Zanskar is over here. And the Saltoro range or the Lesser Karakoram is over here. So you can see we have one, two, three continents and one, two ocean basins and maybe another ocean basin over here and maybe another small continent over here. We are still debating about that and it might prove right. Now you see I have put a scale over here. You can see from Lama Yuru to north of Panamik, uh, the total distance is about 50 miles. So the special thing about Ladakh is within this distance of 50 miles, we have geological records and history of collision of three continents and disappearance of two or three ocean basins. Nowhere in the world you'll find such huge amount of geological information contained in such a small area. Remember the picture I showed you of Tibet. This whole distance is more than 1000 miles. So what you see in 1000 miles in Ladakh, we can see in 50 miles. That's what it makes, makes it geologically such a unique place. And as, uh, as Nigel says, it's not only a heritage for India, it's not only heritage for Ladakh, it's a world heritage site that we all must do our most to preserve and make sure the next generation learns it's, it's a teaching laboratory like which you'll never find anywhere in the world. Okay, so I told you the story here was 
continents were being rifted apart. They were torn apart. As you can see over here, Changtang is being torn apart from Xiao and continents were colliding. So basically a story of collisions and, and tearing apart, which we call rifting. So story of rifting and collision. When continents get rifted, what happens is the rocks, you can see over here, a continent is getting rifted. The rock in the middle gets very thin. If you have a chewing gum and if you pull it, or if you have a snicker bar and you pull it, you'll see how thin the central part becomes. That's what happens. And the deeper part of the earth comes closer to the surface. This is very hot. It starts melting. Those melts come up and they form intrusion into rocks like that. This is very rare things. The rocks that form there are called eclogites. This is a picture of eclogite. This rock you'll find near Puga and in So Murari. So this is a map of So Murari. You can see over here, that's the Indian plate. This is the Indus, uh, Indus River is roughly over here. That's the Ladakh range. All these red uh, stars, and that's So Murari. These are the places where you see this kind of black rocks. When you look, when you take a fresh sample, you'll see them. These are called eclogites. And the green rocks over here, the Nidar Ophiolite, that says, Ophiolites are the rocks that form where continents collide. So you can see within maybe a mile or two, you will see both a vanquished ocean, ocean and a place where continents were torn apart in, in Ladakh. You can see that these rocks came to the surface extremely fast. This graph shows you. These rocks came up, came up from a depth of 110 kilometers and it came up to a depth of about 10, 10 kilometers. From what it, it rose 100 kilometers from inside the earth in almost geologically no time, maybe within a million years or so. That's also pretty amazing. And this is a world heritage place. This is a picture of ocean floor rocks that we see on the mountains. As you can see in the lower picture, the TMC is what we call the Somurari complex. NOC is the Nidar Ophiolite complex. These are ocean floor rocks and these are continental rocks that has been torn apart. You see this roundy structure here, we call them pillows. They form when lavas erupt underwater and those are the type of rocks that you see on ocean floor slivers. These are all the samples of ocean floor rocks that you see uh, in Nidar. And on a hand sample, this rock looks so green, color of snake. The Greek for snake is Ophis. That's why we call these rocks as Ophiolites. Ophiolites are pretty rare, but Ladakh has not one, but possibly three Ophiolites within that 50 miles. And that range in 200 million years in age. That's why Ladakh is so special. And I told you when India under thrust the Asia, when the Indian place is still going underneath the Asia and is pushing up the Asian margin higher up, and as it is pushing up the Asian margin, the mountains are forming. This is the Karakoram mountain. This started forming when Shiok, Shiok collided with Changthang. That was even before India collided with Asia. And, you know, Karakoram means black rocks. Uh, and this is Saserla, the pass on top of Karakoram. And you can see all these black rocks there. I was there in 1974. So this picture is from then, 1975. And this is Depsang Plain. That's where Dalat Beg all is there. You can see you have a absolutely flat ground. You can play hockey there, cricket, football. And this was a plain. This was a flood plain of a, like like our Ganga Valley. The whole thing had rose eighteen thousand feet because of pushing down uh, by India. And these things are preserved in Ladakh, like you will see nowhere in the world. This is a picture from Khardungla. And that's the Ladakh granite that formed when India was, uh, when the Neotethian Ocean was subducting under the Shiok block. This block, black rocks here, this is what you see near Khardung village all the way to Khalsar. I named it as the Khardung Volcanics or the Khardung Formation. These are all volcanic rocks. They form when you have explosive volcanism. And those volcanoes form when a an ocean starts going down under the continent in a subduction zone. And you have a fantastic exposure all the way from Khardum to Khalsar of this continental volcanics. So present day we see this beautiful village of Khardum, but 50, 60 million years ago, that's what this place looked like. In the dark, you have an ocean and you have this huge volcanoes and that were erupting 
like anything all over the place. But the fire is still underground there. This is a picture of Panamic, but Panamic is not the only hot spring there. You have Panamic, we have in Chumathang, we have in Puga, we have near Hanle, we have the other side of the uh, Karakoram Mountains. That shows the fire underground is still there. So this is the fire and this is the pressure that has formed this land of Ladakh. Maybe that's what makes the people there so hardy also. And that's what makes them so resilient. And that's what makes this land so fascinating, a world heritage site. So, so my story ends where India has collided with Asia. The Neotethys Ocean is now totally disappeared, is closed. And India and Shiok and Lhasa, they are one landmass. And Rajiv will tell us what happens after that. Thank you, Professor Srimal. Uh, the story from there on uh, looks like this: that uh, we, uh, the the uh, Indian uh, plate, is nearing uh, or it's closing into the uh, into the Asian plate, and it's passing through. Uh, the tropical uh, equatorial region and as it's pushed pushes on and there are there are so many uh, connections uh, develop gradually these connections then uh, allow uh, biota the, the 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 fauna and the flora of these two huge continents to change, and there was a, 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 a major biodiversity change. One would see many animals and plants from the from the Asian part would swamp into would uh, kind of uh, come into the Indian part, and a lot of Indian elements would uh, get the opportunity to uh, uh, move towards the Eurasian plate. Now the new entrants uh, would be like uh, the terrestrial animals, rhinos, crocodiles, and fishes. Prior to that, before the, the, the ocean recedes, there were these fabulous creatures uh, of the ancient ocean and land, the whales. These, the, these were the times when whales uh, whales started, the ancestral whales were actually walking whales and they started moving into the water, moving into the ocean. So uh, uh, a broad uh, 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 picture shows that as the, the remnant of Tethian Ocean recedes towards uh, the Arabian Sea, as you can see in this picture, uh, uh, one part of the remnant uh, forms just be, uh, below the, the lesser Himalayas and the other, other, other branch or other uh, part was uh, where the, the collision took place, the, the Indus Sucha zone. As these went on, the, as the, the, the water recedes, uh, it uh, the the trough, the canal or uh, a, a basin gets occupied by the newly developed or the paleo drain, drainage of the Indus. So Indus, uh, what we see today, was there since uh, almost the last 20, 25 million years ago, and what we see that. Uh, in those days, these paleo Indus would bring in a lot of sediments from the from the Ladakh area, from the from the uh, batholith, the granites from the north, and would deposit these sediments into the into the, the southern uh, basin. And this was the time when uh, the 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 lush green vegetation was there, and all sorts of animals and 
and uh, uh, large animals and smaller animals and plants live there in this very area. So when we look at the, the, the scenario, uh, what we see is the, a thick pile of sediments, like almost three kilometers of sediments. And those sediments right now sit on the, the granitic, the Ladakh batholith. So what you see on this screen is the, the part of the batholith, the granite here. And on your right hand side, that basically uh, forms the southern part of the, the uh, area is the, the Cargill formation, the, the first formation, which is full of uh, these plant fossils and, uh, and animal fossils. So uh, uh, just the last year, we, we found a lot of animal fossils. I, would, uh, I will be explaining to you what we have found there. Now this is our team and uh, it's an Indo-German team. So uh, uh, this guy is uh, Vasim who lives in Cargill. So he's been given this PhD area. So he's kind of uh, there and he's still exploring the area. So what you see is sand, clay, uh, very similar to uh, the, the sand and clay, uh, the Indus uh, River deposits today. But these were the ancient times because uh, uh, of uh, deposition for many, many millions of years, these sand and clay bands have, the, the colors have changed. So over the Cargill formation, there is another thick pile of uh, sediments, which are called Tharumsa formation. Uh, and they, they, they're full of uh, organic material, a lot of leaves, a lot of uh, uh, organic bands are found uh, in this and we have found uh, remnants of uh, 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 algae, algal material as well as uh, uh, leaf uh, fragments and over it uh, uh, posthum formation lies. So there is a thick thick pile of sediments which uh, were deposited now they because of tilting and uh, thrusting pushing off uh, the, the, the Himalayas these are now exposed. So the, these, uh, what you see here is a, is a jaw of uh, an early uh, uh, mouse deer called tra uh, tragolids. These are tragolids, they still live. They live in, in the uh, northeastern part of India, but not here. And uh, we have named uh, the, them as Nala Merix because of the, the, the Nala, along which this was found. And they're, uh, they're still around in the Northeast. And then we have rhino fossils. So uh, uh, rhinos, which uh, basically uh, uh, evolved in the Northern part, they got an opportunity to move towards South and they, we have found their fossils. Our, our uh, scientists uh, uh, in the past, they have found. Their, their skull, the whole skull uh, was found. Now, uh, what we are doing is we are trying to look at the micro fossils these days, because, you know, large fossils are easy to found, find, but uh, micro fossils, they give us a, a, huge, a lot of information about the ecology, about the environment of the climate. So we are basically these days looking at micro fossils and doing some isotope analysis of them so that we know what kind of rainfall pattern uh, there was and what kind of uh, vegetation, what kind of ecological conditions were there. So when we look at the micro fossils, uh, of course, you won't be able to see them very clearly here. Uh, they, these are so, some of the gastropods. These are snails, land snails, and there are some uh, bivalves. These are clams. So we have uh, their impressions as well as complete uh, fossils as well. So uh, just to give you an idea what, uh, what these algal remains we find, these are called carophytes. So we find these uh, uh, tiny little uh, round calcitic uh, uh, gyrogonites uh, preserved, very well preserved in the, in the, in the rocks, in the, in the sediments there. And also we have snails, land snails and, and, uh, and clams, uh, 
of course the, these are modern clamps but to give you a perspective what uh, what uh, what uh, kind of clamps the freshwater clamps and a lot of fish uh, elements a lot of fish bones scales we have found so uh, to give you a perspective of the uh, place what we see is an arid landscape but we, when we go back in time some 25 million years ago it was a tropical rainforest and on top of it we ha we have found a rat that is called phalomis which which was supposed to live here and and other places uh, it has been found in in uh, bukti uh, in pakistan and other places uh, in uh, 25 million years uh, uh, sediments and also it has been found in 10 million years uh, uh, rocks of uh, china china uh, and and in japan but recently uh, it was found it was found in a market uh, in laos so there you see this rodent that lives that lives in a tropical rainforest so what you see today the badlands the 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 the, the dry lands it wasn't there it, 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 there was it was lush green vegetation and all sorts of animals and plants, including sal forests were there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is where I would end my talk. Uh, awesome. Thank you, uh, Professor Patnaik. This is illuminating. I think uh, you briefly touch upon the fact that you find uh, this uh, wonderful launestis uh, uh, discovery of this new uh, uh, rodent. I think it is very telling because uh, you know we live in a time of pandemics and many of those uh, epidemics and outbreaks happen because of wet markets and <clears throat> us exploring these creatures and trading into them. But I think uh, let's, in interest of time, I think we've got about 10 minutes and I would now uh, return back to uh, Professor Nigel Hughes for any closing remarks or any comments or any, uh, any uh, way forward for how we want to take uh, you know, uh, the discussion forward, yeah. conserving and preserving uh, the natural heritage of Ladakh region. Well, I, I, uh, I hope we've uh, made a case um, in this discussion of just, you know, how splendidly unique um, the geology of Ladakh is. Um, it, it's not only beautifully exposed thanks to the high elevation, but it's beautifully complex and it tells multiple stories of multiple oceans um, of the way the earth has changed from very deep inside the earth, rocks coming up like the eclogites, um, and, uh, um, you know, to rocks that are forming at the earth's surface, to things that um, uh, are, you know, ancient tropical rainforests. Everything you could imagine is preserved um, there. And so this is, this is these are stories. And geology is, is so wonderful because, as we said at the beginning, it's, it's, it's a book. And uh, we just need to learn the language of the book um, in order to enjoy and appreciate it. And it, it really isn't that difficult to get an understanding that uh, can then you know, be taken into the field and you start to see not just the landscape as it is today, but the hidden landscape, the ancient landscapes that are there. And, and, and I think for you know, the, the educational potential um, for um, young people in the subcontinent. You know, you don't have to know the structure of the atom or all the chemistry or physics. These, these are things, uh, you know, how the earth is, how it's changed through time. This is a tremendous way um, for educating children about science and about the way the, uh, the, earth, has, the earth has changed and nowhere better than, um, than Ladakh. Um, so um, my, my feeling is that uh, Ladakh in particular, um, but India in general is um, uh, is just a, you know, a place that deserves um, multiple institutions that tell the story and share this story with with the public of the of the subcontinent, um, because this is this is what the Earth itself says about this history, and it is a truly magnificent history. Um, so we're involved, in, uh, Pranay and I and, and Rajiv and, and many involved with an initiative called TIME, the Indian Museum of the Earth, with the idea of a national institution that will tell this, this story. But, but Ladakh itself deserves a, 
a special institution of its own um, because uh, because the the story there is you know, where better um, than to tell such a story. Thank you so much, Nigel. I think uh, Professor Srimal, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are bubbling all over me. I mean, there's not one thought, but 20 <laughs> thoughts. Firstly, you know, I think all of us understand that this is a unique world heritage site. It's, it, I mean, there's so much geological history that's preserved here from 400 million years till today, from 100 kilometers inside the earth to, to the surface rock that Rajiv so nicely explained. But apart from that, we have to, it's, it's, you know, it's our responsibility, not only us, but everyone who's listening to this, their responsibility is to make sure that this thing does not get ruined, number one. And number two, I mean, we should make it possible for this to be an educational place. So I can tell at least, I can name at least 20 places where we should have national or international geological monuments. Those should be world heritage sites, like the Nidar Valley, where you have the Ophiolites, like the Puga and the Eclogites, you know, uh, like the Khartoum Volcanics. I mean, we have so many places. So all of those, we should have protected world geological monument sites. Second thing is we have to make sure, I mean, all places in the world does that. If you go to Canadian Rockies, if you go to Venice, they limit tourism we got to limit tourism and we got to limit uncontrolled tourism. Whoever comes should come through a local group which has been vetted by the authorities, by the local people. Once they are small groups, they can go out for trekking. I mean, it's a trekker's paradise, right? But you have to make sure. And thirdly, please, I mean, this place has millions and millions of tons of limestone, all those things. Don't put another cement factory there. You don't earn much money from a cement factory. You earn much, much more through tourism without ruining anything. That will be much better for that. And fourthly, what I really would like to do is to have a summer international field camp for college and university students. You know, have a one month or two month field camps, charge them $2,000 or something, which is very reasonable by, you know, European or American standard and show them the ophiolites and the arc volcanics and how the continents have collided, the different kinds of structures and fossils. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's that's a great idea. The last, last idea, I mean, all the ideas are good, but the last idea is a very concrete and po very possible thing to, to yeah. be done and to and, establish and, a center and yeah. for doing that. And, yeah. and we got to have a very good uh, world-class geological museum. It's very easy to do. I mean, there's so many yep. things there. All you have to do is pick it up and put it there. And on all those places in Panamik, you know, in Nidar Valley, put a big sign showing the geological history of the region, make it permanent so that people and, and make a self-guided tectonic tour. You have a pamphlet or booklet, people read that, go there and teach themselves. But make sure there's no uncontrolled tourism and no uncontrolled you know, smashing of rocks and taking up samples. I was in Uttarakhand a couple of months back and one of the young geologists wanted to show me fold in limestones within the cell crystal. And so he went there and said, darn, I mean, they have blasted away the whole thing. That would have been very important geological find there. So we have to make sure that we don't do that in Ladakh. Whenever you are making a road or, or a big project, have some geologist who knows the geology with you and try to preserve as much as you can. As I told you, it's not only Ladakh's heritage, it's a world heritage. That's right. And over to you, Professor Patnaik, uh, any final words from you? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, ha I, I, I totally agree with Nigel and Professor uh, Srimal that we need to preserve this uh, fantastic, um, uh, the amazing place, this heritage of ours. I got the opportunity to give a talk uh, in a Cargill College uh, last year, where a lot of geology students uh, attend, attended that, uh, that uh, talk, and I was really delighted to interact with them. So, they, so there is a college there. So we have a, a we can, if we spread the awareness that this is your heritage, you preserve it. It's a, it's a world museum as such. It's a natural history museum out there. It is, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's an amazing place. It, it has got the history preserved as such you know there's so much that needs to be done and understood uh, but before we do any of that i think uh, we need to like professor srimal and uh, nigel said that you know let us uh, urgently get 
a committed group of people to uh, work towards uh, protecting uh, the important geological sites that we identify. Absolutely. And I think uh, what also we need is uh, possibly a small museum. Uh, but before we do all of this, I think we also need to get co uh, commitment from local communities. I think this is where it should all begin. But yes. And also, like Professor Patnaik just said, that uh, you know we would need uh, lots of local capacity in terms of field guys and trained naturalists. We need finance and, and geologists. Yes. Uh, and if sorry, and geologists too. Yeah, the geologists. Absolutely. I mean, they they could be geologists. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, see, uh, you you go to countries like Namibia, South Africa, even Indonesia. Uh, you find uh, geology students as natural history uh, people explain things to you about the forest or the or, or a lake or an extinct volcano. I you think see them the in story, Yellowstone National the Park also everywhere. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, I'm I, I'm just giving you examples from developing countries. I mean, and think is that you have geologists who interpret natural sciences in a very deep perspective, and I think that's something that we need to build into Ladakh and Leh region. Uh, I think field guides are essential. What is solely missing, not just in Ladakh, but also in, in India, are smaller regional museums. I mean, why just regional? It can be very, very small museums, about two rooms, three rooms, and even open air museums. Why not? I mean, in, in yeah. Panamic, it should be an open air museum. Why should you create a structure there? You don't need a structure. So um, let me just thank, uh, you know, my my three guests. I mean, they're not guests to me, uh, and we are ni neither guests of yeah, Ladakh. Comrades, <laughs> citizens. Yeah, 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 we are citizens of Ladakh. <laughs> uh, we feel ourselves that we have been there, and we feel committed to protect and conserve it in every way. Right. Uh, I think our role is to illuminate the minds of those who come there and those who are going there. We don't need to build malls and highways, as Professor Srimal said. I think we need to preserve nature's way. Uh, and I hope this message and the appeal of the three geologists and myself, who passionately believe that we must be, let Ladakh be the way it is, and I hope it reaches the ears of policymakers and local decision makers and the community at large, so that they can keep what they have in, inherited in the way that they, they found out. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, and I know this is uh, uh, well past your bedtime in, in Florida. I know night is approaching in, in California, and I know, Professor Patnaik, you have um, uh, uh, to go and lecture in a college uh, in your in your today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, so, so, so let's, uh, let's call it a day, and, you know, he's hoping that you know, Ladakh will remain the paradise that it is, and, Absolutely. you know, in, and hope that all goes the way that we have, we are imagining it to be. And, right. and if there's anything we can do, our service is there, and it's free, you know. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, until next time.